digging by Seamus Heaney. Between my finger and my thumb, the squat pen rests, snug as a gun. Under my window, a clean rasping sound when the spade sinks into gravelly ground. My father digging, I look down, till his straining rump among the flower beds bends low, comes up twenty years away, stooping in rhythm through potato drills where he was digging. The coarse boot nestled on the lug, the shaft against the inside knee was levered firmly. He rooted out tall tops and buried the bright edge deep to scatter new potatoes that we picked, loving their cool hardness in our hands. By God, the old man could handle a spade, just like his old man. My grandfather cut more turf in a day than any other man on Toner's Bob. Once I carried him milk in a bottle, corked sloppily with paper. He straightened up to drink it, then fell to right away, nicking and slicing neatly, heaving sods over his shoulder going down and down for the good turf, digging. The cold smell of potato mold, the squelch and slap of soggy peat, the curt cuts of an edge through living roots awaken in my head. But I've no spade to follow men like them. Between my finger and my thumb, a squat pen rests. I'll dig with it. Welcome to Lit Poetry and our discussion today of the poem Digging by Irish poet Seamus Heaney. Heaney was born and raised in Northern Ireland, growing up in a Catholic household and living through the very difficult time of the Troubles in Northern Ireland. This was a conflict involving Republican and Loyalist paramilitary groups. Despite this ongoing conflict, Heaney generally resisted writing political poems throughout his career though, focusing instead on simple aspects of daily life. Heaney is noted in particular for his great perception of the inherent beauty of local environments and was a master of observation. Next to W.B. Yeats, Heaney is perhaps Ireland's best known and most loved poet. Influenced by poets like Ted Hughes and Robert Frost, Heaney's poetry was acknowledged in 1995 when he was awarded literature's highest honour, the Nobel Prize, for works of lyrical beauty and ethical depth, which exalt everyday miracles and the living past. The poem Digging is the opening poem of Heaney's first published collection of poems, Death of a Naturalist, which is firmly rooted in Heaney's experiences of rural life. As such, the opening poem, Digging, is both an invocation and a manifesto. As an invocation, Digging calls on the spirits of his ancestors for inspiration, much as ancient classical writers will call on the heavenly muses for help. The muses here being his father and his grandfather, who inspire him by their honesty, artistry, prowess and hard work. As a manifesto or mission statement, it is these particular qualities cherished by Heaney that form the basis of the kind of writer the poet wants to be as he embarks upon his writing career. Form. Digging doesn't follow the typical poetic form. Rather, it's eight stanzas differ in length, some short, some medium, others long. The initial impact of this is, is visual, taking into account the poem's main metaphorical idea that writing is a kind of labour, like digging. We can interpret 
these chunks of text on the pages representing clods of earth turned over by a spade, like clods of earth. The stanzas are made out of the same fertile material, language being scooped out of the page in different sizes. Enjambment. Now before doing a close line-by-line -line analysis of the poem, a few words about enjambment are necessary. About half the lines in digging are enjammed, and for good reasons. Just think about it. This constant enjambment, when combined with the poem's use of irregular end-stop pauses, helps to create this sort of stop-start effect, which actually mimics the physical effort required in digging. The flow is punctuated here and there by pauses that reflect the digger stopping his hard labour to collect his breath before continuing on. A particularly memorable enjambment also happens at the end of the second stanza, which is enjambed right across the stanza itself. This takes place after the word down, as Heaney delves down through his memories, just as the enjambment urges the reader's eyes down the page for the continuation of the sentence. And downwards, of course, is the direction of digging itself. Between my finger and my thumb, the squat pen rests, snug as a gun. The poem opens with an image of the poet himself hovering over the page, a pen rests between his fingers, snug as a gun. This odd simile, introduced after Sejura following the word rest, finishes with a dramatic pause. It is an image for the reader to dwell upon. Guns, of course, are carefully designed to, to fit the contours of a hand, and, it, and their use, it goes without saying, can have powerful and very dire consequences. In this way, the simile sort of reminds the reader of the old adage, the pen is mightier than the sword, and here Heaney might be suggesting that the writer has serious responsibilities. After all, written words can have a great destructive impact and power in our world, too often being used in our world to conceal the truth or prop up powerful agendas or promote unhealthy egotism. As such, Heaney can see the potential temptations and problems in his chosen career. And he therefore looks to the dignity of his father's work and his father's humble use of tools as a, as a corrective to the journey ahead of him his forebears will be his guide. These first two lines represent a moment of stillness before activity, suggesting that what happens next is partly a meditation on the act of writing itself. Overall, these two lines that open up the poem point to the close relationship between workers and their craft. These lines are packed full of alliteration, consonants and assonance, as though every syllable has been carefully selected by a master craftsman. And they have. Just look at the way the sounds seem to fit with one another. The N's, the S's, the G's, the U's. You know, these sounds very much echo that snug fit of the pen in hand. They're very powerful. Under my window, a clean rasping sound when the spade sinks into gravelly ground. My father digging, I look down. The speaker of the poem in the second stanza recognises the sound of his father gardening outside his window. And from here, the speaker embarks on a journey into the past. Heaney's tendency to farm language for meaningful consonants, alliteration and assonance becomes the poet's own way of, of digging and turning over the fertile soil of language. For example, the alliterations in spade sinks, gravelly ground, and the word digging all the way down to down, focus attention on the construction of language itself shining a light on the work and effort that goes into a written composition. It's also important to acknowledge the use of viewpoint here. The speaker gazes down at his father through the window, 
a similar vantage point to the one the father has over the ground he is working. To achieve their aims, both men look down on the area where they focus their labour and dig. But there's one more character also doing this work, you, the reader. Indeed, the work of looking down on the page to comprehend and interpret the poet's world and his work is the same kind of work itself as is happening in the descriptions of the poem. And this sort of work that you do as the reader can foster personal growth in you in as much as it fosters growth in the writer themselves. Till his straining rump among the flower beds bends low, comes up twenty years away, stooping in rhythm through potato drills where he was digging. Two moments of time phase into one another in stanza two. The poet is present in the first with his father digging among the flower beds and then this is followed by his father standing up straight as a younger man all of a sudden 20 years away digging potato drills. A drill is a small part of land that has been dug for planting crops. What emerges from these memories is a glowing endorsement of his father's prowess, his, his grit and the willingness to see his work through to its conclusion. The consonants in this stanza, however, they're, they're rawer than earlier in the poem. As witnessed with the, the T, the S, the R and the M sounds. The percussive effect of these sounds conveys the, the deep, rooty and earthy effort of the father's work. It also is kind of worth noting the poem's highly effective use of the full stop here, which again reflects somebody digging in a field, but then stopping to lean on their spade to catch their breath. In fact, there are, there are three other places in the poem in which the word digging is followed by a full stop. Also notice the assonance on the oo sound that appears in line eight, in stooping in rhythm through. The same sound echoes through the next stanza as well in the word boot, rooted, too, new and cool. This assonance assists the writing to feel at once regular, smooth and meditative thereby mimicking the, the rhythmical and smooth nature of the speaker's father as he labours, which continues on in the next stanza. The coarse boot nestled on the lug. The shaft against the inside knee was levered firmly. He rooted out tall tops buried the bright edge deep to scatter new potatoes that we picked, loving their cool hardness in our hands. In this section, the speaker recalls a childhood memory. This recollection is captured in meticulous detail. The scene illustrates how the good and dignified work of digging is not as easy as it might seem. Rather, this work takes genuine prowess. The, the speaker elevates his father's labour to the level of artistry, honouring its earnestness, its physicality, and of course, its, its value. There is something quite sensuous and tactile about this stanza. Here the speaker explains how he and his family would pick the potatoes, loving their cool hardness in our hands. The potatoes are cool because they've been preserved deep in the ground until they're unearthed. In a way, this love explores the really close connection between the Irish and the land on which they live. This homage towards his father's prowess and work ethic also plays out through the careful selection of the language in this section, the, the lug, where you place your foot on the spade, the shaft, the long part of the spade, and the tall tops, the top parts of the potatoes, are all words that have been used with such precision. The effort to find the exact right words mirrors the precise physical effort that the father uses in cultivation. And this is further emphasized in this stanza by the precise and deliberate alliteration 
consonants and assonants once again that runs through this stanza. We hear this in the in the T's, in the D's, in the O's, the H's and the L's. By God, the old man could handle a spade, just like his old man. Just like a spade digging deeper and deeper into the earth, the poem goes deeper into the speaker's memory. By God is an intensifying phrase that signals the level of the speaker's reverence for his father. Once again, the end stop line after old man hints at the speaker himself taking a moment to wipe the sweat from his brow before continuing. The assonants in the lines are important too. The use of the letter A, you know, it creates a mirror sound between the two words. These words are in sync with each other, just as the father is in sync with handling the spade itself. My grandfather cut more turf in a day than any other man on Toner's bog. Once I carried him milk in a bottle, corked sloppily with paper. He straightened up to drink it, then fell to right away, nicking and slicing neatly, heaving sods over his shoulder going down and down for the good turf digging. After the end stop, the poem digs deeper into the speaker's past, now looking at the next layer of the speaker's family, the speaker's grandfather, who was adept at wielding a spade too. Digging then is a kind of tradition the speaker inherits. While the speaker's father worked the land to cultivate potatoes, the speaker remembers his grandfather cutting turf. And, and turf is a type of peat found widely in Irish bogs and used as a fuel for fire. Turf, like the humble potato, is an important part of Irish history and culture. And the use of the word toners gives the memory a specific location, drawing the reader into the world of the poem and gently reinforcing the idea of tradition passed from one family member to the next. In stanza number six, you know, Heaney examines the memory of his grandfather as a child, tasked with the job of taking milk to his grandfather in the field. The milk in the bottle he carried was kept in place by a little piece of crumpled paper. The assonance and consonance in these lines is again vivid and noteworthy. The many K, L, P and the short I sound seem to spill out from the page invoking the image of, of milk splashing all over the place as it's carried by the clumsy hands of a child. It's just stunning writing and it's so beautiful. The rest of this section recounts how the speaker's grandfather responded. Rather than taking an extended break, he, he gulps down the sustenance and returns to the task at hand. The enjambment between these lines, with one line smoothly flowing into the next, suggests the continuous effort, the description of the nicking and slicing, beautifully invoking an onomatopoeic soundscape that, you know, where the words echo the actual sounds they describe. The cold smell of potato mould, the squelch and slap of soggy peat, the curt cuts of an edge through living roots awaken in my head. But I've no spade to follow men like them. This stanza goes beyond just using alliteration, consonants and assonance and leans heavily on the brilliant use of onomatopoeia in the quest to bring digging truly to life. And, and Heaney was really well known for his ability to use onomatopoeia in his poetry. The words squelch, slap, soggy, and the phrase curt cuts are evidence of languages' capacity to figuratively recreate the events they describe and bring them tangibly to life. For example, the word squelch, the way the letters squash together it actually sounds like people stepping through wet, muddy earth. The word slap, with its firm P sound, has a, has a physicality about it that suggests, you know, the, the recreation of that actual sound itself. The slap, curt cuts, has short, tight sounds that 
cut off the airflow in the mouth and, and, and it kind of mimics the sound of metal slicing through wet earth. The power of language here establishes roots in, in Heaney's head and awakens his desire and ability to, to recreate the world through poetry. As the speaker admits in line 28, he is in a sense breaking with tradition because he has no spade to follow men like them. Yet, while he can't follow his forebears into the you know into exact same kind of work, he can embody the values that they represent. And this is pretty important. Between my finger and my thumb, a squat pen rests. I'll dig with it. The eighth stanza returns the poem to the present. As with the beginning, the reader is given an image of the speaker hovering over the page, pen in hand, thinking about what he will write. It's important that the poem ends here in the future tense, the speaker making a sincere commitment to his work, writing, I'll dig with it. That is, he will work hard at it over and over without complaint, inspired by what he's learned from his ancestors. Heaney resolves to embody the values of his inherited rural tradition. Hard work, grit, concentration, persistence and prowess. Moreover, he seeks to replicate the unpretentious dignity of the working class and their spirit, the spirit that's encapsulated in his forebears. Instead of working the land, however, and growing produce to feed the body, Heaney aims to cultivate language and to produce poems capable of feeding the soul. Thank you.